So, exoplanets. Um, it's crazy. When I was born, people didn't even know that exoplanets existed. And now, 25 years later, there are thousands of them. And, yeah, it's like the most significant thing I can think of that's happened in my lifetime, finding planets around other stars. We used to think there are only eight or nine, and now there are just so many worlds to discover. And, and so we're finding all these exoplanets, and there are categories entire categories of planets that we didn't even know existed that don't exist in our own solar system mm-hmm. like uh super earth super earth yeah. super earth those are really odd <laughs> yeah <laughs> what would that be like so you're on a planet that we're pretty sure is solid has some kind of a solid surface mm-hmm. but these things have like four to five times the mass the, of the earth right so the huge gravity yeah <laughs> you know i i guess i mean we, we don't we know that they're not physically much larger than the earth mm-hmm. they're probably maybe they could be a little bit larger yeah, but they're very dense. Yeah. So, and and then the question is, how do these things form? I mm-hmm. mean, we you know we we now know that you get these giant planets like Jupiter that can actually fall in towards the the star, and and then the, the star could blow away all the outer layers. Are, are these sort of the cores of of giant planets that have gotten blown away or something? It must be because I think there's there isn't really another way for a rocky planet to get that, that dense. much mass. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're, they're a huge mystery. I mean, they, these are one of these the things that, you know, like, who ordered, who ordered that, right? I mean, you know, we, we did not know we were going to be finding that. Right, and the question of if super-Earths can be habitable, I've, um, one question would be, can plate tectonics exist on super-Earths? And I've mm-hmm. heard conflicting theories mm-hmm. of if it would be more or less likely, and plate tectonics is probably something that's kind of necessary for life, right? Um, well, it certainly has helped life on Earth. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Life as we know it, anyway. People really take that for granted. You know, plate tectonics has allowed the Earth's climate to be both, you know, relatively stable, but also to change. You know, not, not so stable that nothing changes. Mm-hmm. You know, several times we, uh, we sort of sucked all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then the planet's gotten very cold. And, and what warms it up again are the volcanoes. You know, it, it, it kind of keeps our whole carbon cycle in balance. I and mean, yeah. people have no idea how important plate tectonics are. So this are. ring of fire around the plate boundaries yeah. is what keeps things going. All the subduction zones, all the minerals being melted down, but then the carbon release is just mm-hmm. so cool. Mm-hmm. And you also need geologic activity to have a magnetic field around your planet, which is also essential for life mm-hmm. because or else everything would just um, fry up, right? <laughs> all the radiation. Yeah, the radiation would really pound us if we didn't have a magnetic field. It's a very important part of the Earth. I guess it you know, kind of depends if you were under the water. Now, you could have a place like you know, Europa, mm-hmm. where um, you know, Europa doesn't really have much of a magnetic field of its own, and it's in this huge, high-energy magnetic environment of Jupiter, right? I mean, being on Europa is kind of like being in a particle accelerator. I mean, the, the radiation is just awful, because Jupiter has this big magnetic field that's, that's strafing all this stuff around. But if you were under the ice, then you'd be okay. So it, it, it's, it does somewhat depend on what you define as life. I mean, I think, I think in all of the examples you've given, you're talking complex life, life that might form a civilization, you know, build telescopes, rockets. But as far as the simple kind of microbial life, you know, there maybe it's not so important. I mean, you know, Mars may have microbial life, but the outer moons of the solar system may have that, yeah. you know, even without that. It the could be weather. very resilient to radiation or That's high right. temperatures, may not even need water. I mean, think about uh, water bears, right? I mean, water bears, mm-hmm. tardigrades are these tiny little microscopic animals that yeah. are, are honestly probably, there's probably a couple of them in my, my hand right now. <laughs> you know, they, they live on moss and on grass, and they're, they're, they could, a single one of these tiny little things ha- could uh, withstand enough radiation to kill 100 elephants. Not that I recommend killing elephants. <laughs> but uh, why does that thing have the resistance that it does, this little microorganism? Mm-hmm. So what... Um, what's next for studying exoplanets? I know you're working with W first. How would mm-hmm. how would W first contribute to our knowledge of exoplanets? It should make a major step forward because what we'll be able to do with the coronagraph on W first. So this is an instrument that blocks out the star. Mm-hmm. Originally, there was instruments like this to block out the sun and look for the corona of the sun, and they just had a crude blocking element. But these are a lot more sophisticated, and they can block out the starlight to a factor of one part in a billion. And then you can actually see the plant, the exoplanets around the star. Right, so the direct imaging. Right. Which would be We awesome. won't be able to see the oceans on them. It's not that kind of imaging, but we'll sure. be able to see that it's a spot 
and look with a spectrograph and see, is there oxygen there? Mm -hmm. what, what's the atmosphere yeah. like? That would be amazing to be able to actually do spectroscopy and see the biomarkers on the exoplanets. Um, what would be the ideal thing you'd be looking for if you're trying to find Earth's twin? What, what would you be seeing? That's a good question spectroscopically. I mean, one of the, the big things people talk about a lot is oxygen because mm -hmm. um, oxygen is very difficult to keep at any high level of, of abundance in an atmosphere because it, it just it combines with everything, right? I mean, oxygen combines with rocks, you know, rusts, metals, it burns, you know, it, it, it's sucked up by plant life or by actually, you know, plant life gives it off, but animal life breathes it in. So it's one of these things where something has to sort of be actively putting it into the atmosphere. And uh, it, in fact, it's one of the things people get wrong about uh, the Earth that you ask most grade school kids, you know, what's the most common gas in the atmosphere? And they think, well, we, we need oxygen, right? And right. you have to break it to them that we live in an 80% nitrogen, nitrogen. In right. the atmosphere. There's <laughs> not that much oxygen. We're lucky because of that. But, but now, you know, even that, there's going to be this period of time where we're, I think we're just going to be frustrated because you know, now there are other models of different sorts of planets with different sorts of geology mm -hmm. where they're demonstrating you can have high levels of oxygen even without the presence of life. So there, there's going to be this time where we have a strong oxygen signal from an exoplanet and then we'll just get to argue about it. What caused it? <laughs> and, and that unfortunately will be, I think, where we'll be for quite some time. Now on the Earth, the oxygen actually came from life. Mm -hmm. The first couple of billion years of the Earth yep. didn't have oxygen in the atmosphere. Right, and right. And then when life formed, it changed the whole chemistry of the atmosphere. Methane-based life. I, I, my, my favorite jewelry, have you, have you ever seen this stuff called tiger iron ore? Yeah, that's neat. I, it's amazing. It's iron ore from the time when oxygen was first being released into the atmosphere. And so as the sediments of iron sort of went down on the, like the bottom of a, of a river, there'd be a level that was highly mm. oxidized, but then all the oxygen had gotten sucked out of the atmosphere by this geologic process. Mm -hmm. And so the next layer of iron was not very oxidized. And then there'd be more oxygen released and the cycle would kind of repeat. And so you get these stripes of rusty and non-rusty iron. It's called tiger iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's cheap. You can get the stuff on eBay for $5. But you know- Yeah, you, it looks really awesome. It, the, the, you you're holding in your hand the time when oxygen was being released for mm -hmm. the first time into our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Blows your mind. <laughs> I've also heard that um, it, it would be a biosignature to see oxygen or ozone at the same time as something like methane because um, you, you need to have life to have both oxidizing and reducing mm, yeah. gases yeah. in the atmosphere at the same time. Well, of course, that depends on what you call life. <laughs> right. Life as we it's know all it. life as we know it because, I mean, how right. can we really guess what life is like Well, that's the first like place to look, don't of know course. It. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder if, like, me would, would methane-based life behave the same way? You know, when you have a, an environment like Titan, right? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. methane lakes. Yeah, that's right. And, and there, there, there are actually some bacteria. They're rare, but you find them in the bottom of the ocean. There are actually some Earth bacteria that, me that can metabolize methane. So, you know, have we looked to see what sort of biosignatures that kind of life produces? Mm -hmm. Right. Well... It would be great to go to Titan and <laughs> yeah, yes, I <laughs> agree. See. Right, well, we, we to are going to do that yeah. at some point. I mean, at we've already point. had probes go down onto the surface of Titan and see the lakes anyway. So, I mean, th that was some of the most exciting time in my wow. life was the first see, you know, what Titan looked like. It was completely different than the Earth. Yeah. So there, are, so I guess there's like basically three different ways that we're searching for life. We're looking for life within our solar system, most likely microbial life, looking for biomarkers on exoplanets, mm -hmm. and then also looking for um, trying to detect extraterrestrial yeah. life. SETI, that's right. Steady. Right. Um, which of the three do you think might give us results first? Oh, I think we'll find microbial life in the solar system before we have confirmation of it elsewhere. I mean, okay. I think for a while we're going to have exoplanets that we think, oh, that looks really interesting, you know. I mean, People will argue whether that's enough methane or enough oxygen to really show that you have life. Mm -hmm. But but I, I don't know. I mean, I I think we very well may find microbial life in the solar system in several places. Mm -hmm. it, it may be on Mars and Europa and Titan and Enceladus. I mean, there's there's yeah. not just one place we might find it. It's even possible that the life got there from Earth. <laughs> yeah. Or life on Earth got there from Mars in a previous epoch. Well, we talked about those, those tardigrades, those tiny little microorganisms. I mean, one idea is the reason they're so able to withstand radiation and harsh environments is that they you know they did at one point come from somewhere else and the only mm -hmm. thing that survived was stuff that had the ability to do that mm -hmm. 
we'll probably see signatures of oxygen on exoplanets perhaps before we find microbial I, life in the solar system, true. but we won't know how to interpret it exactly. Yeah. You know, is that really due to life or is it due to some other chemical process going on in the... So that, that's just a bet, you know, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Seth Shostak. Who I am steady. too, yeah. And then Seth always teases mm. us at NASA because he says, well, you guys are looking for pond scum. I'm looking for civilizations. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd, be, I'd be really happy with some pond scum. And he made that prediction earlier this year saying yeah. that... We're probably going to find extraterrestrial life by 2040. I, um, I, I hope so. I <laughs> yeah, hope so. that'd be great. Yeah. On the other hand, if we found a, a signal with SETI, you know, I think it would alter the entire, our whole civilization. Mm -hmm. Or potentially could. Depends yeah, what we definitely. find. If it's close enough, you know, perhaps over decades we could communicate with that civilization, assuming that they have the same kind of life form that we are. What do you think are the chances uh, I know we've um, made efforts to possibly communicate before via ro um, via spacecraft like mm -hmm. Viking. What do you think are the chances of anyone actually coming across anything that we've put out so far? Well, the main thing was the Arecibo message, right? I mean, so something like like Voyager, which is wandering around with that mm -hmm. lovely gold plate that Voyager, Carl Sagan designed. Yeah, yeah it's not Viking. Uh, no, well, yeah. uh, Viking had I think something on it too on Mars. It? So it probably had some little plaque, but. Uh, um, I mean, the, the chances of anybody finding that is really, really small. But but the the Arecibo signal went out to quite a, a large region of the right. If anyone's stars, listening, yeah. they will hear that. Yeah. And what they do with that, we'll, we'll never know. <laughs> we did. We have given them directions. You know, they they know that we're here. I uh, I just you know I, I, these are just these are just guesses. Yeah. You know, I, I, I definitely think that there's life out there because in our own galaxy, we estimate there to be a, about a hundred billion planets. That's based on the Kepler statistics. Amazing, One amazing. galaxy, right? We know. A so there's as many planets as there are stars. Just about. Just that's about. right. I mean, something on the order. But they are awfully far between and awfully far. <laughs> the, the distances are just unbelievable. Right. right. You know, the, the problem with making. The problem with making a model of the galaxy is that you're, you're used to a solar system where let's put the sun here and you know the first planet's right about there and there's a lot of space but you can make a model of the solar system. You, you can't do that with our own galaxy. You know, yeah, it's if, impossible. If it's the, so full of space. If, if the sun were the size of the dot of an <laughs> eye on this page, right, so there's a little period here, a tiny little dot I can barely see, mm -hmm. then our galaxy would stretch to the moon. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's, you can't impossible even, you can't to even, comprehend. I think the, you can't comprehend. the nearest exoplanet that has, uh, you might be in the habitable zone, where you know the temperature allows water to be on the surface, is 12 light years. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty close, but to you know to actually travel there is virtually impossible because right. you can never travel at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. It will be a very different world. I mean, I will wake up in a different mm -hmm. universe. Even if they detect a signal with SETI, even if it's not a communication thing, even if we never decode it, right. but we get something that we can say, this is definitely artificially done. You know, whatever the signal was, it has to, it's mathematically coherent, it has to be artificial. You know, then the next night you look up in the sky and you know that some, somebody else is up there thinking. You know, somebody else right. has a technology, has a civilization. It, that's a whole new universe. Yeah. We detected a periodic signal. We thought it was periodic in the gamma ray band from a nearby star. Hmm. It turns out to be spurious. But there was about three days oh, where wow. there were a couple of us that were just saying, gamma ray communication. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, it's a great time to be alive. I'm excited for it definitely the is. discoveries that are going to be happening in the next few decades. And think about think about the change you've seen in your relatively short life. Mm -hmm. You know, Let's hope there's at least that much and right. maybe more yeah. in the time to come. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. <laughs> thank you. That was fun.